Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel. And today's topic of discussion is an introduction to AC circuit analysis. Our objective is to introduce simple AC sources and introductory AC circuit analysis techniques. We'll examine AC voltage sources that vary not only polarity, but also magnitude as a function of time and explore voltage, current, and power as they relate to AC circuit analysis. Finally, we'll learn to differentiate between average and effective voltage and current values supplied by an AC voltage source and learn to calculate these values. Let's begin with the assumption that you have a working knowledge of DC circuit analysis. Recall that a fixed DC source is one that does not vary polarity nor magnitude as a function of time. Consider a fixed 5 volt DC source and a 100 ohm resistive load. The voltage drop across the 100 ohm resistor would be a fixed 5 volts. The source would supply a constant 50 milliampers of current, and the resistive load will constantly dissipate 250 milliwatts of power. Given the magnitude and polarity of the supply is fixed, current will not only remain constant, but will flow in one direction only. If we were to plot voltage across the resistive load, current through it, and power dissipated by it as a function of time, they'd be relatively uneventful flat lines. This, by the way, should not be news to you, and if it is, I'm sending you all the way back to the beginning of the Basic Electronics 1 DC Circuit Analysis playlist available at the Big Bad Tech channel. Look me up again in two to three months once you've got these concepts down. Assuming you possess these qualifications, let us continue. Fixed DC sources, as implied by their title, are characterized by a fixed constant magnitude. A time variant DC source, in contrast, is one that varies magnitude as a function of time. Examples of time variant DC sources include pulsed DC, sawtooth, and triangle waveforms. The key to identifying these types of time variant DC sources is that though their magnitude may change as a function of time, they never swap polarity and are always on one side of an axis when plotted as a function of time. Given polarity is fixed, current may change in value, but it would flow in one direction only. For example, Consider a pulsed DC waveform that regularly alternates between a 5 volt and 0 volt signal at regular intervals. This symmetric alteration is known as having a 50% duty cycle, being equal periods of fully on and fully off. For the first one second, the source supplies 5 volts, and the next one second, it supplies 0 volts, and the process repeats itself. Notice, although magnitude regularly alternates between full 5 volts, and zero volts, at no time does voltage ever swap polarity and it always remains on one side of the horizontal time axis. Additionally note the schematic symbol for the source has been replaced by a circle with a tiny picture indicating the pulse nature of the applied voltage. Characteristics like peak value, period, frequency, and duty cycle could be used to further classify this time variant waveform. Despite being slightly more complicated, one can still perform Ohm's law analysis at any point in time to find desired circuit properties. When 5 volts is applied to the 100 ohm resistive load, a 5 volt drop will appear across it, 50 milliampers of current will flow clockwise, a presumed positive direction, and the resistive load will dissipate 250 milliwatts of power. When 0 volts is applied to the 100 ohm resistive load, there will be a 0 volt drop across it, 0 milliampers of current will flow through it, and the resistive load will dissipate 0 milliwatts of power. If the process repeated itself, plots of voltage drop across the resistive load, current through it, and power dissipated by it as a function of time would look like this. Notice because this pulse DC voltage source is supplying current to a purely resistive load, the current pulses in beat with the supply, and importantly, flows in one direction only. Additionally, it should be evident, given that the load experiences equal periods of full current and full power, and no current and no power, that one could rightly state that the load on average dissipates half power, or 125 milliwatts, being equal spans of 250 milliwatts and 0 milliwatts, averaged over this analysis period. An AC source, the intended topic of this lecture, is another animal entirely. In contrast to a fixed DC, or direct current source, or a time variant DC source, an AC, or alternating current source, is one that varies both magnitude and polarity as a function of time. Given magnitude and polarity of both variant, we should not only expect variations in current magnitude, but also direction. 
one might assume this might necessitate a wholly different approach to circuit analysis, but rest assured, those techniques as presented in the Basic Electronics 1 DC Circuit Analysis playlist available at the Big Bad Tech channel are just as valid now as they were then. Case in point, take this simple circuit consisting of a pulsed AC voltage source, an ammeter, a 100 ohm resistive load, and a voltmeter hooked up in the following fashion. For the purposes of simplicity, we're going to hook up the ammeter in series, left to right, in to out, and the voltmeter across the load, positive to negative, top to bottom, and just keep them hooked up in this manner. This simple setup is the key to understanding AC. The ammeter and voltmeter are hooked up in this fashion, and they never move. The plot of applied voltage as a function of time for this pulsed AC source indicates something unique. Namely, the source cyclically alternates between positive 5 volts and negative 5 volts. If positive voltage is defined to be positive to negative, top to bottom, negative voltage is simply defined as positive to negative, bottom to top. In summary, positive half is 5 volts right side up. Negative half is 5 volts upside down. AC is not magic. It's not special. It's just that polarity cyclically alternates. Given polarity alternates and our ammeter and voltmeter remain fixed, one might expect periods of negative current and negative voltage drop. By the way, positive and negative polarity symbols on an AC source, since it cyclically alternates polarity, really don't mean anything over the long term. If you ever see positive and negative polarity symbols on an AC source, it just means that the source initiates operation with the given polarity. During the positive half of the cycle, as one would expect, the ammeter reads positive 50 milliampers traveling through it into out, and the voltmeter would read a positive to negative voltage drop of 5 volts. The resistive load would be dissipating 250 milliwatts of power. During the negative half of the cycle, things change. Given the ammeter is still in series with our 100 ohm resistive load into out left to right, and the voltmeter across the 100 ohm resistive load is still hooked positive to negative top to bottom, the ammeter still reads 50 milliampers traveling through it, only this time current is traveling out to in. There is still a 5 volt drop across the load, only this time the voltmeter experiences the drop negative to positive. Given the wonky arrangement of the ammeter and voltmeter, the values displayed are accompanied by a negative sign, indicating the 50 milliampers of current is not traveling left to right as anticipated, but rather right to left. And the 5 volt drop is not top to bottom as we expected, but bottom to top. The ammeter is saying negative 50 milliampers is traveling left to right, which we know means positive 50 milliampers is traveling right to left. The voltmeter is saying a negative 5 volt drop is experienced top to bottom, which we again know means that there's a 5 volt drop bottom to top. Even accounting for these wonky sign changes results in positive power. Negative voltage times negative current results in positive dissipation of power. If the process repeated itself, plots of voltage across the resistive load, current through it, and power dissipated as a function of time would look like this. Long story short, during both the positive and negative halves of the cycle, the 100 ohm resistive load experiences a 5 volt drop, 50 milliampers of current, and dissipates positive 250 milliwatts of power. All the negative signs mean is that we're just too lazy to change the orientation of the ammeter and voltmeter. This is AC, or alternating current circuit analysis, simply meaning that the direction of current changes. AC is not magic. It's not different. It's not special. It's just that you are too lazy to move your measuring equipment every time the voltage swaps polarity. From the perspective of the resistor, it makes no difference if current goes from top to bottom, or bottom to top. At any point in time, one can apply Ohm's law on the power equations to determine the desired quantity. Before we continue, check to see if you're tracking by solving for this example problem. Given a 12 volt source that cyclically alternates polarity every second and a 200 ohm resistive load, plot resultant voltage across the load, current through the load, and power dissipated by the load. Note the ammeter and voltmeter connections never change position. Let's assume the analysis starts with the voltage source oriented positive to negative top to bottom for the first second, then swaps polarity positive to negative bottom to top for the next one second, and so on. By all means, pause the lecture and get to work. Do not just sit there and wait for me to give you the answer. Get to work and plot the voltage across the resistive load, 
current through it, power dissipated by it, given the voltage source swaps polarity every second. If you're tracking, you should have arrived at the following answers. Given the source initiates operation with its polarity oriented positive to negative, top to bottom, from 0 to 1 seconds, both the ammeter and voltmeter should experience positive values. Voltage would be a constant positive 12 volts, and current would be a constant positive 60 milliampers. During this time period, the resistor would constantly be dissipating positive 12 volts times positive 60 milliampers, or positive 720 milliwatts. It makes sense. From 1 to 2 seconds, the analysis is characterized by the 12 volt source oriented such that it is positive terminals on the bottom and negative terminals on the top. Given this flip flopped orientation, both the ammeter and voltmeter should be experiencing negative values. Voltage would be a constant negative 12 volts and current would be negative 60 milliampers. During this time period, the resistor would be constantly dissipating negative 12 volts times negative 60 milliampers or positive 720 milliwatts. It makes sense. The next positive pulse from 2 to 3 seconds is a repeat of the first, where the voltage source is oriented positive to negative top to bottom. Both voltage and current are positive, as is their product power. The next negative pulse is a repeat of the second, where the voltage source is oriented positive to negative bottom to top. Both voltage and current are negative, however their product, power, is positive. The following cycles would essentially be a repeat of our earlier observations. Again, this analysis shows that any point in time, Ohm's law holds true and instantaneous values of voltage, current, and power can be expressed. Really, the only difference between analysis employing a source that regularly swaps polarity and one with a fixed polarity is that current regularly alternates direction. The difficulty for sources that cyclically swap polarity lies in expressing average or effective values. People with a purely mathematical background might be tempted to rush to the conclusion that voltage and current have an average value of zero over the whole time span of analysis since they are regular periods of positive voltage and current combined with an equal and opposite periods of negative voltage and current yielding zero average values. Only in a purely mathematical sense is this correct because we're obviously constantly applying power to this load. For this reason, we've got to be really careful regarding our terminology regarding averages when it comes to AC circuit analysis. For this reason, AC circuit analysis often uses the average power to determine something I'm presently calling the effective voltage and effective current experienced by the load. Recall that power can be calculated using one of three different formulas. Power equals voltage times current. Power also equals current squared times resistance, as well as power equals voltage squared divided by resistance. Rearranging the second and third equations, we find that current is equal to the square root of power divided by resistance, and voltage is equal to the square root of power times resistance. Given our power consumption is a constant 720 milliwatts for all occasions, we can calculate the effective voltage and effective current experienced by the load as, big surprise, 60 milliampers and 12 volts. Note there's no sign associated with effective voltage and current values, meaning that it is of little concern whether current goes left to right or even alternates at all. These effective voltage and effective current figures also imply that a 12 volt DC source of fixed polarity, either upside down or right side up, would also be equally effective at delivering a constant 720 milliwatts of power to this resistive load. Think on this for a moment. A more complicated AC source can be conceptualized as a simpler DC equivalent that delivers the same amount of average power using effective values. More on this in a moment. Moving on. In addition to cyclically alternating polarity, AC sources can also vary magnitude as a function of time. Consider an AC source, ammeter, voltmeter, and resistive load hooked in the previous fashion. However, this time the AC source applies a time variant waveform with the following characteristics. Let's say for one second it applies zero volts. For the next two seconds it supplies positive 30 volts. For the next two seconds, it increases magnitude to positive 60 volts. For the next two seconds, it reduces voltage back to positive 30 volts. Then for the next one second, it supplies zero volts. The next half of the cycle is a repeat of the first, 
only polarity is reversed. For the next one second, it supplies zero volts. For the next two seconds, it supplies negative 30 volts. Or if you want to think of it this way, positive 30 volts, when the source is oriented positive to negative, bottom to top. For the next two seconds, it supplies negative 60 volts. For the next two seconds, it supplies negative 30 volts. Then for the next one second, it supplies zero volts. Then the cycle repeats itself. Zero, positive 30, positive 60, positive 30, zero, negative 30, negative 60, negative 30, zero volts. You get the picture. The analysis of this circuit using only a slightly more complicated source should be no more difficult than our previous analyses given Ohm's laws to be held true at all times. We should be able to plot the resultant current and power over time. Let's assume our resistive load has a magnitude of 300 ohms. When the source is turned on for the first one second, it's characterized by an application of zero volts. Current delivered to the load is zero amps and the power dissipated is zero watts. The next two seconds is characterized by application of positive 30 volts. During this period, current delivered to the load is a constant positive 100 milliampers and power dissipated by it is a constant positive 3 watts. The next two seconds is characterized by application of positive 60 volts. During this period, current delivered to the load is a constant positive 200 milliampers and power dissipated is a constant positive 12 watts. Note by doubling voltage, current also doubles and as a result, power, the product of voltage and current, is quadrupled. The next two seconds is characterized by application of positive 30 volts. As previously, during this period, current delivered to the load is a constant positive 100 milliampers and power dissipated is a constant positive 3 watts. The next two seconds is characterized by application of 0 volts. Current delivered to the load is 0 amps and power dissipated by it is 0 watts. We're now entering the negative half of the cycle which is really only a repeat of the positive half with the exception that polarity is reversed. Current switches direction, however the load dissipates positive power, the product of negative voltage times negative current. The next two seconds is characterized by application of negative 30 volts. During this period, current delivered to the load is a constant negative 100 milliampers and power dissipated is a constant positive 3 watts. The next two seconds is characterized by an application of negative 60 volts. During this period, current delivered to the load is a constant negative 200 milliampers and power dissipated is a constant positive 12 watts. The next two seconds is characterized by an application of negative 30 volts. As previously, during this period, current delivered to the load is a constant negative 100 milliampers and power dissipated by it is a constant positive 3 watts. Finally. The next one second is characterized by application of zero volts. Current delivered to the load is zero amps and power dissipated by it is zero watts. If we continued this analysis into the next positive and negative cyclical alternation of the source and the next and the next, we'd essentially see a repeat of this first full cycle. You'll note, as previously, voltage and current merely alternate polarity and direction and Ohm's law is true at any point in time. For this resistive load, you'll also note that periods of positive voltage and positive current results in positive power equally as effectively as periods of negative voltage and negative current also result in positive power. That's the point of AC circuit analysis. It doesn't matter which direction current is flowing, you're just too lazy to move your instrumentation every time the source swaps polarity. You note in contrast to our previous examples, this resistive load experiences not only varying voltage and current and power, but also periods of no voltage, no current, and no power. Additionally, this load effectively experiences two bursts of power during one full positive and negative alteration of the voltage source. As previously, given the voltage and current both experience equal and opposite periods of positive and negative polarity and direction, one could rightly state that the average value of voltage and current is zero, However, this is true only in a mathematical sense. A more usable figure would be to calculate the effective voltage and effective current using the average power delivered to the load. Conceptually, I like to think of the two bursts of power experienced during one full positive and negative cycle of our voltage source as two piles of sand that can be shifted or shook into position and then leveled out. When the tops are dumped into the holes and the pile leveled off, the remainders are average power. 
Numerically, one could take the instantaneous power experienced every second and divide it by the number of seconds in this analysis. In this case, 0 watts for 1 second, 3 watts for 2 seconds, 12 watts for 2 seconds, 3 watts for 2 seconds, 0 watts for 2 seconds, 3 watts for 2 seconds, 12 watts for 2 seconds, 3 watts for 2 seconds, and 0 watts for 1 second, divided by 16 seconds. This results in an average power dissipation of 4.5 watts. Yes, there are periods the load is just hanging out like your lazy lab partner doing absolutely nothing, and periods when the load is just chugging power. However, when you average them out over time, the load is dissipating 4.5 watts on average for one 16-second cycle. Returning our discussion to effective voltage and current values, consider the voltage and current values necessary to deliver 4.5 watts to a 300 ohm resistive load on average. Recall that power can be calculated using one of three different formulas. Power is voltage times current. Power is also equal to current squared times resistance and voltage squared divided by resistance. Rearranging the second and third equation, we arrive at current equals square root of power divided by resistance and voltage equals the square root of power times resistance. Given our average power dissipation is 4.5 watts, we can calculate that this resistive load experiences an effective voltage of approximately 36.7 volts and an effective current of approximately 122.5 milliampers. These values suggest that a fixed voltage source of 36.7 volts of either polarity would also result in the constant delivery of 4.5 watts of power. Plots of voltage, current, and power for our imagined equivalent circuit making use of a fixed 36.7 volt source appear here. Note for the same time period, both circuits would ultimately deliver the same amount of energy to our load resistor, the difference being that the AC source would deliver it in bursts, whereas the fixed DC equivalent would deliver it one constant steady push. Note because we're solving for effective voltage and effective current values using the average power figure, the values obtained are representative of power's geometric relationship. It does take some calculation, however I'll show you a shortcut in later lectures for sinusoidal values. Before moving on, it's worth at least a moment of our time comparing and contrasting our original AC circuit with an imagined DC equivalent. Note our original AC source varied both polarity and magnitude over the course of a relatively slow 16 second period. If our resistive load was a space heater, either implementation would serve to deliver an equivalent amount of heat energy to the space. If however this resistive load happened to represent a light bulb, you probably wouldn't want to use the AC source as currently defined because the light bulb would do this impossible to ignore slow pulsation between dark and eye scaldingly bright. The DC equivalent, in contrast, would yield a steady source of usable light. One way to fix this problem using AC is to dramatically increase the speed of oscillation to a speed beyond human perception. Let's say we increase oscillation 2, 20, 200, even 2,000 times faster than our present implementation. Oscillating this fast, thermal inertia and persistence of human vision would effectively resolve this into a light bulb of seemingly constant intensity. Which leads us to a question. Which method is better, DC or AC? The answer is, it depends. We'll explore more characteristics of AC in later lectures, but one of the principal advantages of AC is that it's substantially easier to generate and transmit over long distances than DC. Another characteristic of AC is that with changing voltage and changing current, we also gain a changing magnetic field which can be put to work in such applications as motors and transformers. The DC implementation, while effective, does not innately carry a changing magnetic field. It is for these reasons numerous industrial applications make use of AC sources. Before moving on, here's a related example problem to check your level of competency with this iterative instantaneous type of AC circuit analysis. Given an AC source with the following characteristics, plot voltage, current, and power as a function of time. Additionally, determine the average power dissipated by this load, as well as the effective voltage and effective current experienced by the load. Notice the waveform is moving pretty fast, since our time scale is in terms of milliseconds. It completes a full positive to negative cycle in 10 milliseconds, 
five milliseconds, which is on the positive side of the axis, and the other five milliseconds, which is on the negative side of the axis. From zero to one milliseconds, the source is positive 30 volts. From one to two milliseconds, positive 80 volts. From two to three milliseconds, positive 160 volts. From three to four milliseconds, positive 80 volts. And from four to five milliseconds, positive 30 volts. The second half of the cycle is a repeat of the first, only polarity is reversed. From five to six milliseconds, the source is negative 30 volts. From six to seven milliseconds, negative 80 volts. From seven to eight milliseconds, negative 160 volts. From eight to nine milliseconds, negative 80 volts. And from nine to 10 milliseconds, negative 30 volts. The voltage waveform then repeats itself. Let's assume the ammeter and voltmeter remain fixed as illustrated. I mean, really, who could be on the ball enough to swap connections every five milliseconds? Additionally, the AC source is supplying power to a 240 ohm resistive load. Again, we're looking for plots of voltage across the resistive load, current through it, and power dissipated by it. And finally, we're looking for some very specific figures. Notably, what is the average power dissipated by this load? And what is the effective voltage and effective current experienced by this load? By all means, pause the lecture and attempt this on your own. Do not just sit there and wait for me to give you an answer. Get to work and give this your best shot. If you're tracking, you should have arrived at the following answers. Given the source initiates operation oriented positive to negative, top to bottom, the ammeter and voltmeter would experience positive voltage values during the first half of the cycle. During the second half, when the voltage source swaps polarity, the ammeter and voltmeter should experience negative values. During both the positive and negative half of the cycle, the resistor should continually experience positive but varying power. It may seem like there's a lot of repetitive analysis, but there isn't given the positive and negative halves are essentially reflections of each other, the rising half of one side is a reflection of the falling half of that same side. Really, it takes only three separate circuit analyses to get a picture of how this circuit behaves over time. From zero to one millisecond, voltage would be positive 30 volts and current would be positive 125 milliampers. During this time, the resistor would be constantly dissipating positive 30 volts times positive 125 milliampers, or roughly positive 3.8 watts. From one to two milliseconds, Voltage would be positive 80 volts and current would be approximately positive 333.3 milliampers. During this time period, the resistor would be dissipating positive 80 volts times positive 333.3 milliampers or positive 26.7 watts. From two to three milliseconds, voltage would be positive 160 volts and the current would be approximately positive 666.7 milliampers. During this time period, the resistor would be dissipating positive 160 volts times positive 666.7 milliampers or positive 106.7 watts. From four to five milliseconds, it would be a reflection of our rising half, only this time falling. From five to 10 milliseconds, it's a reflection of our positive side, only this time voltage and current are negative. Power, the product of voltage and current, would still be positive. If we wanted to do this for more cycles of the supply voltage waveform, we'd experience a repeat of the first. As previously, note the resistive load experiences two bursts of positive power for every one full cycle of the supply voltage waveform. These bursts of power can be averaged over time to determine the average power dissipated by this load. Doing so yields an average power dissipation of approximately 33.5 watts. Let's now calculate the effective voltage and effective current values necessary to deliver 33.5 watts to a 240 ohm resistive load. Given power can be calculated in one of three formulas, rearranging the second and third formula and substituting in our average power and resistive load, we find an effective voltage value of approximately 89.7 volts and an effective current value of approximately 373.6 milliampers. These values suggest that a fixed voltage source of 89.7 volts of either polarity would also result in the constant delivery of 33.5 watts. The difference being that the AC source delivers this average power in variant magnitude bursts, and the DC source does so in one steady push. Hopefully you arrived at these same answers, and if not, you can always revisit the previous example problem to correct any misconceptions. Moving on. 
Does this level of AC circuit analysis seem easy? It should, because we haven't introduced anything new and have thus far limited our analysis techniques to purely Ohm's law and the power equations, concepts you should readily be familiar with by now. Really the only new thing we've added to our discussion is calculation of average power and effective voltage and effective current values seen by the load. Although these characteristics might seem like mathematical parlor tricks right now, these simplifications convey far more information than one might initially suspect. Though a load in an AC circuit may experience voltage of varying magnitude and varying polarity, current of varying magnitude and direction, and periodic bursts of power, ultimately the AC circuit could be visualized as an imaginary equivalent supplying an effective voltage, an effective current value such that an average power is dissipated. I say again, the load in an AC circuit may experience voltage of varying magnitude and polarity, current of varying magnitude and direction, and periodic bursts of power. Ultimately, the circuit can be visualized as an imaginary equivalent supplying an effective voltage and effective current such that an average power is dissipated. Think on this point until we meet again. Before we say goodbye, let me perform a brief preview of where we're headed. Consider a circuit with an AC voltage source characterized by a continuously variant sine wave peaking just shy of 170 volts, supplying power to a 400 ohm resistor. Unlike the pulsed AC sources we've previously dealt with, this sinusoidal source has a smooth, continuously variant analog nature. Is this any reason to freak out? No. No, it is not. Ohm's law still holds true, as do the power equations. Let's say the voltage waveform has the following values at the following times. One could use Ohm's law and the power equations to solve for current and power values at these specific times. With 84.9 volts across a 400 ohm resistive load, this results in 212.5 milliampers of current and a power dissipation of approximately 18 watts. With 147 volts across a 400 ohm, this would result in 367.5 milliampers of current and a power dissipation of approximately 54 watts. With 169.7 volts across a 400 ohm resistive load, this would result in 424.3 milliampers of current and a power dissipation of approximately 72 watts. If we continued in this fashion for increasingly smaller increments, we'd find that for this purely resistive load, current peaks and valleys at the same time as voltage. This synchronous oscillation is known as being in phase. Additionally, you note that the product of voltage and current, power, should also form a distinctly sinusoidal shape, only it's been shifted to the positive side of the axis given that this is a purely resistive load. Periods of positive voltage and positive current result in positive power, as do periods of negative voltage and negative current. Periods of zero voltage and zero current result in brief moments of zero power. You'll note for one full cycle of voltage and current, the load experiences two bursts of power. Given the resultant power waveform is substantially different than our previous pulsed waveforms, one might initially assume calculating average power is slightly more complicated. However, notice the sinusoidal power waveform is symmetric in nature around a horizontal line running right through the middle of it. This is where it's helpful to think of averaging as piles of sand that can be moved and leveled. The peaks above the horizontal line of symmetry perfectly match the valleys below it. Is it any wonder that a symmetric power waveform cyclically peaking at 72 watts and bottoming out at 0 watts has an average value of 36 watts? No. No, there isn't. It makes sense. Now, given the load on average experiences 36 watts of power, you should be able to calculate the effective voltage and effective current seen by this 400 ohm resistive load. By all means, pause the lecture and do so now. If you've done so correctly, you should have determined that the 400 ohm resistive load experiences an effective voltage of 120 volts and effective current of 300 milliampers. Yes, it should be evident that the load experiences voltage of varying magnitude and varying polarity, current of varying magnitude and changing direction, and periodic bursts of power, but on average it dissipates 36 watts of power 
and experiences an effective voltage of 120 volts and an effective current of 300 milliampers. Given this is a purely resistive load, power is always positive and voltage and current are in phase or match each other with simultaneous peaks and valleys. This is AC circuit analysis and this is where we're headed. Yes, one could perform instantaneous analysis at specific points in time, but often it's a waste of time to do so given we can assume sinusoidal input results in sinusoidal output. Often it's far easier to conceptualize sinusoidally variant voltage and current waveforms as effective values and use only these effective values for calculation purposes. In summary, Effective values make it far easier to conceptualize and manipulate more complicated waveforms as we'll learn in later lectures. Until then, this concludes this brief introduction to AC circuit analysis. In conclusion, this lecture presented an introduction to AC circuit analysis. We learned that Ohm's law and the power equations are valid for sources that not only vary magnitude, but also polarity as a function of time. Additionally, we learned to calculate average power and effective voltage and effective current values for AC waveforms. Remember to review this material as often as you need to really drive it home. And imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.